for your presentation. Thanks. From what I hear, it's been very well attended, and the talks have been frank and uh, uh, open. So, as the last speaker, I hope I can keep you engaged. Uh, just by way of background, Muscira, we set up offices in Zimbabwe about two years ago. Uh, it was a very difficult board decision because many said uh, the other places to place capital, they are about to be proven right in terms of bond notes. Let's see. Um, Rescuero with Global Investment Advisors uh, started our lives in Cape Town really with the view to assisting primarily pension fund trustees have a better understanding of the balance sheet. What are the assets doing? Do they understand what the assets are doing? And what, or, or what the assets doing speaking to what the liabilities are doing? And with that, you introduce, or we introduce tools and processes to better track what investment managers are saying and what investment managers are doing and the fullness of time ensuring that uh, hopefully through our intervention the assets meet liability. In terms of today's talk, I think in the, in the program uh, we, we, we are introduced to speaking about Bright Africa. Bright Africa is a report that we've been authoring, it's now going into our third year, really with the intent of ensuring that primarily developed market investors have a much better understanding of investing in Africa. Uh, the first time we went to present in the UK, I sat next to a lady from Japan and said, Hi, I'm Gerald Gundwa from Harare. And she's like, Oh, really? I know Ole Gunn from, from Ghana. Do you know? Harare <laughs> 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 is slightly, in fact, Harare is a long way away from Accra. And uh, that's also applicable to our own African pension funds. Uh, what we found as we have uh, developed the Bright Africa report so that uh, our own African pension funds don't actually understand each other as well. So a case in point is involved when pension funds cannot invest outside of the problem. But similarly so, we find uh, Botswana pension funds can invest 70% outside of Botswana. Out of that 70%, 0% is coming to Zimbabwe. Why? And as we went through Bright Africa, what was very clear is that uh, both international investors as well as our own African investors don't know how to invest in Africa. They don't know how to differentiate the difference between Ghana and Zimbabwe. And more importantly, what are the thematics that you should be looking for? Right? Is rising disposable income a thematic that is as applicable in Zimbabwe as it is in Nigeria? So what we did is that we put together geographies that we thought were useful in terms of understanding commonality, culture, uh, trade relations between African countries and African jurisdictions. We came up with nine, uh, and the report uh, really then goes into speaking about key economic enablers and drivers within all of those nine um, regions. The talk today, after speaking to Shepard, is really to say, okay, so Bright Africa is fantastic, but you're speaking to a Zimbabwean audience, and the Zimbabwean audience has got very good bandwidth, so they can access your report. What we want to do is we want to understand what is the relevance of Bright Africa to Zimbabwe and more specifically what is increasingly becoming very topical amongst pension funds and uh, I suppose asset allocators in Zimbabwe in that private equity. Okay. We sat in a pension fund trustee meeting uh, about two weeks ago and the trustee said, Gerald, we want to hear nothing else and we will not allow an investment manager into the room because we've lost 60% dollar value in the last year. So we have to invest in something else. You can't continue to invest in Delta, Ethernet, etc. So you must go and look for alternative assets. And I thought to myself, whoa, whoa. So this is throwing the baby out of the bathwater. What do you mean by alternative assets? What is private equity? What is your understanding of private equity? And what makes you so sure that the return <coughs> will be different? So hopefully, uh, during the next 25 minutes, we'll take you through that asset class and really to ensure that uh, as actuaries um, and as the previous speaker mentioned, you have a very close ear to the trustees, to the principal officers. Uh, you, you also speak to boards of directors and, and, and insurance companies and the like to ensure that we introduce uh, a high level of understanding and better rigor in terms of understanding the private equity and the asset class. So stay with me. Four areas that we're going to touch on. First of all, let's establish what are the parameters in terms of how we should approach uh, looking at this asset class, right? There is nothing more dangerous than 
speaking to a group of trustees who are fiduciaries, by the way, and saying to them, because the equity markets have not worked, you should be going into alternative assets, but you're not actually giving them a glide path or a, or a methodology or even frameworks as to how to approach the asset class. Right? So hopefully we can assist you and, and, and speak through that. The next thing is value, right? You are telling people to enter into an asset class that is effectively not traded. There is no private equity market in the market, right? There, there is no equivalence to the DSC uh, within unlisted markets. So, how are you going to value these things? Okay. How are you going to define value? What is the judging you're going to use? And is the valuation methodology going to be consistent? Again, we have just, uh, with Mr. Hyde, uh, established a pension fund where they did a valuation for the properties. And uh, we used three values. Two of the values came up with a value that was 70% less than what the property was valued at last year. And many may say, well, the market has changed, the environment has changed, etc. But when you read the valuation report, there was no rational methodology to say, well, this is why it's 70% less. Right? And similarly, so the trustees didn't understand the interest. Third matrix, risk. Right? I'm speaking to an audience that are PhDs on risk, so <laughs> I'll not elaborate on that. And then, uh, last matrix is really to say there are merits of investing in the asset class for so long as we've addressed matrices one to three. Simple definition, you're investing in an unlisted asset, right? And whether you're investing in equity or bonds or preference shares or ventures, it's not listed, right? More importantly, and the key takeaway is that you are investing in this asset class for a reasonably long period of time. Right? The mere fact that it's not going to be listed compels us to actually take a much closer look and ensuring that we have a much better understanding of what we're about to jump into. Right? Once you're in, you're in. It's very difficult to get out of it. It is not an infinite share. You cannot just suddenly wake up tomorrow and tell your broker, you made the wrong decision, please sell it. Right? So how do we go about ensuring that the rigor that you're employing in terms of understanding what you're getting into is correct. So let's establish the correct approach. Independent valuation of this unlisted asset. It is not the chairman of the board of trustees coming and saying, guys, we've got a fantastic idea. The garage down the road, which is owned by my aunt, would be a very good asset class for the pension fund. Right? He's conflicted. Right. You need to get people who have no vested interest in valuing this asset to value it for you. More importantly, you must remember in your position, and uh, I would go so far as to say as uh, the actuaries on pension funds and actuaries on, on, on various boards that you sit on within the uh, pensions and savings space, you're also fiduciaries. Right? They are looking to you as advisors and as counsel to ensure that the right decision is being made for the members. So it's to consciously remember that the investment that is being made must be suitable for this pension fund. Is there an investment policy statement that has a provision for private equity as an asset class? Then lastly, and we'll touch on us um, uh, in the next slide, is they have to be standards that you're applying in terms of introducing this asset. Uh, within the private equity space, uh, we, there are four standards, uh, but generally everyone is drawing upon uh, the IPEC guidelines. <coughs> I've still got you. So the key thing is just don't jump into it. Yes, we understand that the uh, Zimbabwe stock exchange is down 60% in two years, but that does not necessarily compel you to just jump into the private equity asset class. Why are you doing it? And do you understand? how you are going to go about doing it. I think what's most important, important uh, for this audience as actually is to say there is no, um, uh, there is no uh, necessary reason for you to understand all those um, evaluation guidelines or evaluation codes, but there is a compelling reason for you as uh, advisors and as those that have got the closest uh, eye and ear to your trustees to probe those people who are coming to the fund. This investment manager who suddenly bought this asset, how has he gone about uh, checking the suitability of it? Right? Are there any independent guidelines or frameworks that you can then go call upon and say, well, if you score
calling this thing with the hundred, if I follow the same methodology in standard, do I also come up to a hundred? In the case of our, of our pension fund with the property managers, we certainly did not come up with a 70% less valuation for properties that were worth 70% more last year. There has to be something that can be repeatable and, 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 and independently verifiable in terms of the valuation process, particularly because it's an unlisted asset. What is fair value? In this market, the uh, this time last week, the ZSC traded $100,000. Yesterday, the ZSC traded $1.3 million and was down 3%. Today, the ZSC traded $800,000 and was flat. The listed market in, the, in Zimbabwe is extremely volatile. I was sitting yesterday with a new chief actuary at Old Mutual and he said, I don't understand. The level of volatility that you guys deal with I was in, the, in this market is crazy. Now, amplify that volatility to an unlisted space. Yeah. How is this person coming about with this value? And what standards do they use to say, you know what, this thing should be worth 100 as opposed to 30, or this thing should actually be worth 130? In our work that we do with a lot of asset allocators, is that it's important that we unpack fair value, and the IPF guidelines give that. In that it has to be an asset that you are looking at where you have no pressure to either buy or sell the asset. You have no pressure in terms of time to buy or sell the asset. But what you want to do is to ascertain, one, the methodology that I'm applying to value this asset. Right? Is it consistent with the underlying fundamentals of this asset? So with a property portfolio, the net rental income that I'm getting, has it been consistent for the last three years? Or has this thing only been getting you know, rental income for the last six months? How repeatable are these fundamentals of this asset that I'm getting? Once I've understood that, it's important that we apply, similarly so in terms of the, the market, would I be able to sell this thing to someone who has not got pressure to buy it? Would I be able to sell this thing if I don't have pressure to sell it? Right? It must be an orderly transaction. And one would go so far as to say, if you look at the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange at the moment, and apply that to an unlisted space, you have a lot of for sellers. It does not make sense to me Anyway, that the price of Delta four years ago was near a dollar, and suddenly the price of Delta today is around a 40 or 50 cents. Who is selling this thing that has grown so much in the last four years at bargain basement prices? You have to be distressed. We have to at least foresee an environment that is completely distressed that you're willing to sell something for 50% of what it was worth before. Lastly, I think more importantly in terms of uh, pension funds contemplating investing in, in, in private equity as an asset class, there is no orderly market at this point in time in the world. So you have Takura, you may have Old Mutual, um, you may have uh, Investing, um, but there is no active market for these type of assets at this point in time. So buy beware, way, right? Many people may come to you and say, no, it's an unlisted business. If you invest in it, it's going to do better than the, you know, what you can buy in the stock market. You know, it's doing better than Zico, you know, but it will one day list. And we're of the contention that it will only list for so long as there are trade buyers, or for so long as there are people who can say to you, you as the seller, don't list it, we will buy it. In this market, they are few and far between at this point in time. So buy beware. It's important when you're looking at private equity as an asset class that the same principles that you are going to use when you go to Mbaramsi to buy or sell an orange should be no different to the principles that you're using to your asset classes when you're going to right? uh, A case in point is that we looked and valued a business uh, in, within the oil and gas sector uh, in Zimbabwe. And the person said to us that, no, we're using the same principles of what we saw within the oil and gas sector in Africa a year ago. Now in my mind that's just like saying to me, this banana that you're buying is a year old, but it's fresh. Can't you? <laughs> and no trader in Madam City will buy a year old banana at you know a dollar for five or whatever the game at the moment. More importantly
importantly, and I must emphasize again, they have to be market participants for unlisted assets. Again, within this market, it's few and far between. In the absence of market participants, you are going to get greater differentiation or, or a greater divergence in terms of what the seller wants for the asset versus what the buyer is willing to, to sell for. Right? Or to buy for. Most importantly, and I think one of the speakers spoke before, private equity invest, investment um, encapsulates a lot of judgments. And again, as actuaries that are sitting and counseling uh, pension fund trustees, it's not only up to the principal officer to understand what judgment has been used in terms of coming up with a value for this asset, but also up to you. If the principal officer does come to you and say, you know what, this investment manager is saying that we should buy, uh, let me think, uh, we should buy into the IPO for Gate Bucks. And uh, we have been receiving broker reports that says Getbox is more valuable than HPC. Does that make sense? What judgment has been applied in terms of understanding whether uh, a, a bank that is in FinTech is more valuable than a bank that's got Pippi Motor? Right? What, is the, what is the valuation methodology that's been applied in terms of understanding? More importantly, who is doing the judging? Are the trustees and are you as actuaries and are the investment managers agreeing on the judgment calls that have been made on these asset classes, or are you just price takers? Right? What's more important for us is really to research the way in which this person has come up with the valuation. Right? Question how they have come up with the material business drivers for the for the for the unlisted business. And more importantly, how is this thing going to actually unlock value in the future? You're buying into a business for the view of growing cash flows into the future. But how is that actually going to be unlocked within a macro environment that at the moment is very constrained? And is it taking into cognizance the competition in the environment? In our view, no business operates on an island, particularly in Zimbabwe, where the macro indicators are not speaking to a fantastic growth story. Yeah. Uh, Often a lot of people when they are saying value a business in sub-Saharan Africa, they use pure play comparables. So they say to you, uh, a business in uh, Mozambique and a business in Zambia and a business in Kenya, and if you compare it to a business in Zimbabwe, you must use those types of multiples. But our environment is very different. Uh, Mr. Hoto mentioned uh, a lot of the uh, growth variables on the right-hand side of that graph that are if you're in Kenya at the moment, there is 5% uh, nominal growth in dollars. Right? <coughs> Consumer disposable income in Kenya in the last three years has gone up 16% per annum. Right? And there's lots of availability of funding. Now, contrast that to Zimbabwe, and now contrast that to the businesses operating in Zimbabwe. Without those macro fundamentals being right, it's very difficult for us to justify the left hand side. <coughs> if anything, we can see it in the last three years with the number of company closures that um, the macro environment is not supporting the left hand side of the graph. But having said that, if you are a business, in our view, in Zimbabwe that has reinvested in the uh, business model over the last three to four years and have had access to capital. And have had and have run a very lean business model. You are starting to see those businesses that are going to grow in the foreseeable future in a very tough environment. Right? How do we know that? Because we are starting to see a lot more interest in Zimbabwean businesses from South African capital allocators. We are now starting to see a lot more interest in Zimbabwean businesses from Mauritian capital allocators and from Zambian capital allocators. Uh, the weak have fallen and those that have survived are likely to survive for the foreseeable future. So things specific to evaluation, <coughs> you can read one, two, three, and four at your leisure. I'm going to focus on the last one, the liquidity. In this current environment, uh, driving here yeah, at road past FPC, there's <coughs> lots of people queuing outside FPC, right, trying to access liquidity. Now, 
con uh, contrast and, and, and juxtapose that to the, to the entire economy and try and now understand how businesses are going to survive within that type of environment. Very difficult. So risk, in our view, we want to understand those four quadrants, but more importantly, again, within this environment, it's the capital structure. Right? Those that are highly geared at the moment will least likely survive in a very constrained environment. Right? A lot of companies in Zimbabwe have spent a lot on plant capacity and, and, and tried to, to come up to speed, but again, taking from uh, Mr. Wojtos' words, have you been reinvesting in business models that are actually not going to survive in the foreseeable future? You know, who are you actually competing against? You servicing 13 million people within an economy versus uh, an Egyptian company that's servicing 140 million people. That has no problem in terms of accessing uh, foreign capital. More importantly, your exposure to cyclicality. Now, um, we had a discussion with uh, invested the other day and they were lamenting the fact that seven years ago six years ago when they invested in okay uh, there was no choppy uh, pick and pay hadn't entered the market and the turnover back then was 200 million dollars and you're getting 20 million dollars of profit okay. this week we here invested turned over 400 million dollars and made billion million the cyclicality that businesses are exposed to here in Zimbabwe are certainly not the same levels of cyclicality that you're going to get from operators in, in other regions in Africa. It, it boggles the mind how for 12 months you can generate a turnover of $400 million and, and really make a million dollars profit. That's, that's, that is a first in our experience. So there's massive risk. And we can really understand what return we want to achieve. But we are of the opinion a lot of our pension funds need to really classify and, uh, and, and uh, come up with matrices around identifying risks in terms of the private equity as an asset class. It's taken as a um, foregone conclusion or as a, 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 a um, a risk, or rather a thought process that is not well thought out when you're investing in the listed space, but in the unlisted space, again, because you are investing in an illiquid market, you really need to think a lot more in terms of um, uh, the risk that you're exposing capital. The, the, in, in, our, in our world, risk is not volatility, but it's actually permanent capital loss. Within this environment, as we've seen, businesses close, banks fail, that's permanent capital loss. And for, for us, that is the greatest risk we're seeing uh, in this environment. So whilst I get some water to drink, I'm going to let you watch a video. Thank you. Thank you. I'll let you press play. I think in this environment, what we're faced with is um, two combinations. You've got systemic risk and unsystemic risk. I'm not going to for that. What's more important for us is really to identify those companies that can best navigate the, or, or have, best, have got the best business models to ride out the unsystemic risk. We are not in control of the systemic risk. So in terms of if we all now have to adopt bond notes tomorrow, our view is that uh, you can adopt a bond rate, but you are going to find a way of buying uh, the next bottle of beer or the next pack of cigarettes that you need to buy, and who's going to be the key beneficiary of that economic activity. Right. We're also of the opinion when you are looking at private equity as an asset class, 
there are any way you can reduce the risk of lack of liquidity as well as lack of information around it is to look at more than one opportunity. So when you are contemplating or advising your, your trustees in terms of contemplating this asset class, it certainly should not just be one asset. Uh, rather wait for the opportunity in terms of more than one asset or more than one opportunity being presented to you. I won't play with that. You guys are professionals at that. The merits of the asset class. Rather small, but the top line shows uh, the performance of private equity and, and venture capital as an asset class in the States over the last 60 years. The orange dotted line in the middle this orange dotted line in the middle shows the performance of private equity as an asset class in Africa, excluding South Africa. Right? This line here shows the MSCI emerging market. So, experience and uh, real world examples show me that from a volatility perspective, the asset class is actually one, not performing your listed equity market, and two, uh, listed, listed equity African market and two is a lot less volatile um, than uh, the listed equity market. Right? It's going to retain value. Locally, thank you to Atchison for giving us this data. So in 2009, they took a bunch of pension funds with no exposure to private equity as an asset class and diversified the portfolios. Right? In 2015, you're only looking at 50% exposure. Uh, to listed equity. Right. How has that worked? The green line. Right. The actuarial index and CPI. Exposure to this alternative asset class has certainly paid off for this pension fund. Right. If you just go back, have these guys remained in listed equity to what most other pension funds are at the moment, it would certainly not be the story. <coughs> Internationally, in 1995, if you're a U.S. pension fund, you didn't actually need to worry about diversification. You had sufficient returns coming from only investing in fixed income. Right? In a low yield world, where now if you're in Switzerland, uh, you're actually getting negative returns. Right? It certainly is pushing a lot more international pension funds to start looking at diversity. 1995, no exposure to private equity as an asset class. 2015, nearly 12%. Where is this 12% going? A lot of it is staying in the traditional capital market, but a huge wall of that money is now coming into Africa. And what is it in being invested into Bright, Bright Africa report? So this 12% constitutes, uh, in our estimates, uh, circa $300 billion. 2015. Of that $300 billion, where is the big money going? Uh, consumer discretionary is getting a big portion of that. So, a recent run, well, not a recent, three years ago, uh, mass market in South Africa being sold uh, for the highest uh, um, enterprise value uh, for consumer discretionary. A big component of that is also going into uh, consumer staple businesses uh, as well as energy and healthcare. Right? For us, uh, African pension funds don't necessarily need to rework the wheel. You basically need to ride along the curtails of where the developed capital markets are going. They take the first lot, effectively, in terms of uh, exposure to private equity in Africa. The number of transactions is also increasing. Uh, if we look at 2006, again, the consumer discretionary the sector was getting a massive allocation towards private equity firms are transacting uh, substantially in terms of consumer discretionary, but this allocation is now a lot more balanced. Right? Uh, consumer staples is getting a, a massive portion of money, but the sector that we are seeing much increased focus and attention on in terms of private equity allocated is energy. We all have experienced power cuts in Zimbabwe and Zambia and in the rest of Africa. Energy is receiving out of the 300 billion and 200 in, in 2015, energy is now getting an estimated 20% of that allocation. And that's energy across all sectors renewable energy, green energy, um, and uh, the less clean forms of energy as well. Our African 
implications on doing that figure of 300 billion, you can manage it. And you can actually top it if we add the insurance money. Right. So again, in terms of our responsibility of investing in terms of our own backyard, we certainly have the firepower to do so, but we need to develop the <laughs> knowledge, skill, and expertise of investing within our own country as well as uh, in other African countries. What is it that we are looking for? So here are your current main operators within this market. So the criteria that we look for in terms of looking at these managers is what is their track record? Um, what is their deal pipeline? So they bring in more than just one deal. Um, how, what operational experiences they have, do they have? And how long has this team been investing together? Sakura Capital has been uh, probably so the longest track record in this market, but you now have more operators coming into this market uh, to assist the development of their asset class. One minute left. So, investment horizon, three to seven years. I think key for us is to say venture capital is unlikely to be an asset class that many of our pension funds will, want and will, will have an understanding of nor will they have a risk appetite. A lot of the pension funds in Zimbabwe and in Africa are going for this portion of the asset class to expand companies. So it's got one factory and wants to put two factories. Or it's, it's currently operating in Zimbabwe and it now wants to expand to Malawi and Swaziland and The performance of growth and expansion capital is a, a lot easier to model as well. This is a boom and bust. You can only have one Facebook or one Alibaba. You can have a lot more um, uh, petroleum, you can have a lot more um, traffic routers investing in Africa. Key is there needs to be a change in investment policy statements. A lot of our pension funds either don't have it or what they do have needs to be revised. Again, we will look to you uh, to assist them in terms of developing that. And then lastly, and most importantly from a risk perspective, we are not seeing a lot of this happening amongst our pension funds. Again, the conversation that we would love to have uh, with you as actors in terms of saying, are the guys actually implementing this and is it now adhering to this or is it still hit or miss? Are the managers doing what the managers are doing and suddenly delivering results that either meet expectations or don't uh, meet expectations of trustees? Questions, please. <coughs> Actually, in the room, uh, primarily it's one of my favorite topics. Um, I, I think this is more like a comment uh, rather than a question. I, I think if you look at the demographics of Africa going forward, Zimbabwe included there, I, I think private equity is a no brainer. You just need to look at the experience in more advanced markets, or even at the stage you went back to your Asian tiger economies back in the late 90s. I think PE is basically a no-brainer. I think our challenge in Zimbabwe is uh, issues to do with regulation, issues to do with uh, capacity, like you mentioned, the lack of uh, sufficient skills based because managing PE uh, assets is basically a specialized investment skill. That at the present moment, we, there is not sufficient depth and critical mass in order for it to be an effective asset. But then again, the, the, the theme for this uh, convention is innovation, so I think the challenge is also to the asset managers in the, in, in the house to start looking into developing those specialized skills so that uh, our pension fund clients can have access to these asset funds. Um, PE is mentioned also in one of your last slides, there. It's, it's a long-term play, so uh, with, with the level of risk aversion that you can find among pension fund trustees, uh, there is that difficulty of explaining that you can spend the next three years just pouring money in, into a PE investment without any significant positive return that you see. But in the long run, when the returns start coming in, they can be quite significant. I think um, uh, I saw a report from um, uh, Watson, I think, one of the big uh, international insurer consulting firms that actually said in, in 
actual effect on your risk adjusted basis, uh, a lot of PE investments, especially in Europe and the United States, have actually had, have actually been uh, less risky but with a higher return than your equities, which is kind of a bit of a, uh, surprising because many people tend to think PE is essentially very risky, but that hasn't turned out to be necessarily the case in, in a more advanced market. So I think my, my opinion uh, uh, for Zimbabwe 24 is that um, maybe the pension fund industry needs to be better organized amongst themselves. Like you mentioned earlier in your presentation, knowing uh, who the players are in terms of uh, PE managers and knowing each other as pension funds because my, the best approach I think in the short to medium term for me is for pension funds to adopt a, um, a consortium approach. So you identify a, a potential PE investment and instead of one pension fund simply saying we identified this unlisted company and we're going to pour you know, $2 million into it, pension funds come together, they talk to each other and then they decide that, oh, you know what, this is a, a, a solid company, they, they, they have a good track record, they, their outlook is very positive, so I think we, we can come together if this fund puts in you know, a hundred thousand, another fund in 150. I think that is one potential uh, way of managing the risk going forward because uh, talking from experience also, I think pension fund trustees are very skeptical. They, they, they don't want to get burnt. I think if, if the losses of the stock market in recent years are anything to go by and they're told that PE is actually riskier than the ZSE, then I think it becomes a very difficult uh, thing to sell to them. But going forward, I think it is almost a perfect match in, in terms of the investment horizon. Pension fund uh, liabilities are long term, and uh, PE as an asset class has this, a, a long term investment outlook. So I, I think going forward, though it might take time, but I think uh, in, in the medium term, I think this is potentially a very uh, good and lucrative asset class for, for our institutional investors. The, the role of uh, illiquid asset class in, in an economy that's um, struggling for liquidity at the moment, using that, um, and also a question around whether the frequency of valuations has anything to do with smoothing the volatility of the volatility in value. Do you want me to answer that or take it around and then answer? Uh, question. Uh, my name is a simple question. Um, a pension fund. They can, well, at the end of the day, the economics shouldn't be different. Um, but what you are buying into is a bigger claim to, to the cash flows um, in terms of private equity. Um, and, and, and more importantly, in terms of the internal generation of those cash flows. So the IRR for internal rate of return for, um, okay versus the internal rate of return for topics, um, uh, versus the internal rate of return of an unlisted business. Uh, for all intents and purposes, course should be the same if, if it's in the same economy. But from a private equity perspective, you have the ability to take, to take a greater claim of that portion of the IRR. Um, and, and then secondly, you also can um, uh, have the opportunity to get capital uplift once uh, in principle, you list that business uh, because you're in an early stage investor in that business. Uh, you can sell it a multiple to what you initially bought in that. Um, but I, I do take your point that uh, the, the fundamentals shouldn't be shouldn't be any different. Uh, a widget is a widget is a widget. Um, in terms of asset allocation, no, certainly we would not advocate a 50/50 a in terms of private equity as an asset class. I think what um, the uh, Atkinson survey was clearly showing is that there are merits in terms of diversifying into uh, private equity as an asset class, and it's proven within the Zimbabwean environment over the last, uh, say, five years, that it is generating returns that are better than the listed market. Right? But I also think that in terms of um, uh, developing the asset class, unless the pension funds are actually for Unless if we as service providers to pension funds start to give them more information about these alternative assets, then they're not going to do it. Right? An alternative asset is not necessarily just investing in the choppy part two. 
uh, it could be participating in terms of um, uh, developing a uh, hydro uh, some competing power plant in uh, the Eastern Highlands, where you know that uh, ZESA or ZETPC will give you a uh, fair price in terms of what you can sell into the grid, and that will give you a fairly non-volatile stream of cash flows for an extended period of time. Is that better than hoping that uh, the fortunes of uh, Zico will turn around? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. The answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> in terms of the liquidity of the asset class and the valuation, um, maybe to put it this way, so a lot of our pension funds um, have an allocation, an IP, has also got a guideline in terms of investing in money markets. Yeah. Now I mentioned the um, observation I made when I was driving here to say there were people staying in the queue to access deposits from a bank. Okay. Now, intuitively, if people are waiting to access the deposits and you have a thousand dollars in the bank but you're only getting a hundred, and on the other side of it, you have a pension fund that's saying, I have a money market asset, that is a bank's deposit, and I'm not marking that to market. So I'm still valuing it at 100. But you can see in the environment that those deposits are not there. Is that still, one, a safe investment, and two, should it still be valued at 100 cents on the dollar? I'll leave that to you guys to decide. But more importantly, so let's look at the question of liquidity. How liquid is the Zimbabwe stock exchange at this point in time? Right. So if you are making an asset allocation decision based on liquidity, a stock exchange where for all intents and purposes, even if you invest in Econos or Delta, it will still take you upwards of 270 days to reduce $100,000 exposure based on the liquidity at the moment. Right? Is that still a valid case of saying Econet and Delta are better liquidity options than investing in a cash generative business that is not listed, but that can pay you uh, cash dividends? It's in this market, it stands to reason. In terms of valuation, certainly. Uh, from our perspective, we, um, well, depending on the asset owner, best practice for, is for valuation to take place on a quarterly basis, but more importantly, to ensure that the methodology being used in um, applying those valuations are uh, in accordance with the international private equity guidelines. Ladies and gentlemen, Gerald Kondo.